thanks for coming in. Thanks for uh, staying with me in the afternoon. Uh, I hope I will not bore you to sleep. Um, so when we talk about traditional advertising for games and we ask us the question of why this works for games, it's kind of funny because um, if you think back to when gaming started to be a thing in the 80s, there was only traditional advertising. Uh, there was print ads, TV ads, that sort of thing. That's how gaming became big. And we ask us this question now in the year 2016 because gaming has changed and evolved a lot and because we have many different facets of gaming. We have mobile gaming, PC gaming, console gaming, free to play, blah, 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 lots of different things. And um, I want to give you a little bit of background and kind of separate the gaming space into two very easily understandable chunks, which are mobile and AAA. And this is a very, um, like, very simple distinction. And it's uh, not nuanced enough to really look at the gaming market, but it works for our example today. And I want to do this uh, to kind of explain where the current mobile marketing thinking for games is and how it is changing at the moment. So first, I want to start with the kind of explanation of how mobile games got to where they are today. So the games that we play on our phones today are essentially um, descendants of these two titles. On the left, we have a game called Lineage, which came out in 1998 on the PC, and it's probably the most important PC massive multiplayer online role-playing game ever made. Uh, it's still played to this day. It's a game out of Korea, um, and it has absolutely shaped how we uh, play online role-playing games, how we play together online, and uh, how game design and free-to-play design work. Um, Gamers in Korea are very, very hardcore. They spend a lot of time playing. Um, they are not afraid of complex, uh, complex gaming mechanics. They are very happy to spend money to achieve goals in their games. And uh, since Korea was a very poor country in the 90s, they didn't have any consoles. Uh, console manufacturers just didn't sell in Korea. So you only had PC games. And PC games were all uh, like uh, copied and stolen. So um, the, P the PC companies were like, OK, if we want to make money with our games, we cannot sell them over the counter. We have to make a subscription or some other in-app purchase model. So this is how the freemium model that we now know in gaming came up. And so all thanks to Lineage and other games of its ilk, um, we now know how to monetize people uh, on phones, how to make them spend a lot of time in games, how to give them complex um, gaming experiences, how to make them play against each other, and basically spend a lot of time and money in very hardcore type environments. So that's the one half of the mobile gaming space. The other game, I'm sure everybody knows, this is Farmville. Do you remember Farmville? Do you remember Facebook 2009, 2010, all those invites, people trying to gift you like pumpkins and all kinds of crap? Um, Zynga, the company that made Farmville, was just in the right place at the right time. In 2010, gaming on Facebook really took off. Um, it was super easy to acquire people into your games because you could share all these notifications. Uh, it was a loophole that Facebook eventually closed, but at the time, Zynga and quite a few other companies managed to really capitalize on that and very, very cheaply put a lot of people into their games, um, which were in themselves not that deep or complex, but they didn't even have to be because there were so many people playing. They were so easily accessible that your mom could just play them and enjoy them because it's so nice and pretty, and I'm building my farm and whatever. And they were monetized through a combination of in-app purchases and advertising, because there were so many people that were maybe not that engaged, but you know, they were spending time, they were looking at the screen, so you could show them ads. So these two extremes kind of form the basis of mobile gaming today, I would say. And um, what's important to note about the Farmville example is that it also shaped the way mobile marketers think today. Because at the time, uh, it became almost more important to get people into your game than to make a good game. Because you were making uh, design decisions informed by marketing. You were doing your UA campaigns. You were paying very cheaply for uh, people to come into the game. You were really tracking, OK, what are these guys doing in the game? When are they dropping off? Where are they spending? Is the button red or blue? What's more important? So the craft and artistry of game design um, to a certain extent became less important, and it was more important to look at cohorts and just really effectively drive people into games. And this um, 
was very possible on Facebook at the time. It no longer is. Later, the same was true for mobile. It was very possible to uh, acquire people really cheaply on mobile. Um, 2013, a lot of ad companies made a lot of money uh, thanks to King because they were just spending so much on acquiring people. And it was more about getting people in. That was just the most important thing. And then, so this thing, mobile marketing thinking, thanks to Farmville and all the other companies that were spawned out of this in the Bay Area and San Francisco, is all about performance-based, ROI, metrics, cohorts, data-driven. So that's mobile gaming. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what I call AAA games. What I mean is games that you buy for 60 bucks in Media Markt or on Steam or any other outlet. Um, these are different from mobile games. They are, uh, have very high production values. It takes years to make them. They are often tied to a specific console. Today it would be PlayStation 4 or Xbox One. They're tied to the PC. You have to have the equipment. You have to have a big TV. Um, it's an investment to get them. And then also you have to actually buy them to own them. You cannot just like, try them for free. Um, these games take a lot of effort to make. It's very hard to sell them. Some still have to be like, distributed physically, so it's not just, we're not just talking downloads. We're still, even today, talking retail sales. We're talking boxes, manufacturing, shipping, storage. So this is all a very big enterprise. So making these games and the marketing perspective for this kind of game is very different to a mobile game um, because you're spending so much time uh, making this and it's such a big effort for your company. If this game does not win, then you really have a problem. And also, if it wins, you want to have a second and a third game, and you want to build a franchise. And if you're not building a franchise, you're just wasting your time. There's not one Marvel movie in the cinema. There's one Marvel movie every year. There's not one Star Wars sequel. There's three. And then there's not even just three Star Wars sequels. There's prequels in between. So you want to build a franchise. So. I think the fundamental difference between mobile games and the AAA games that I just described is the difference of day one. So for a full price title, day one is the key date. On this day, your game goes on sale. People need to buy it on that day. If nobody is buying your game on that day, you lose. You want to rack up pre-orders before. You want to sell a huge amount of stock on the first day. You want to empty your warehouse. You want to get the people playing. And then you're done. You made your money. Of course, you can sell stuff later, add-ons, blah, blah, blah. But this is the main thing, day one. For a mobile game, of course, day one is important. When you launch, you want a lot of downloads. But you're in, the, you're in there for the long run. You run your game as a service. You want people to come in all the time. You want people to keep spending in your game. People may not spend money on the first day because they want to get used to the game first. They need to figure out, is this fun? Is this worth spending money on? Um, so that's a very, very different way of like, choosing your marketing options for a title. And so I have examples for you. This, uh, anybody recognize this graphic? So this is for No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky was probably the most hyped game this year. It's a game that came out for PlayStation 4 and PC a few weeks ago. Um, gamers have desired this game for the last two years easily. This title has been hyped into oblivion. It's been featured by every gaming magazine almost every day for the last two years. It's been on all the shows. It's been at E3, Gamescom, everywhere. Sony made a big deal out of this title. Um, there, there was a, a very huge traditional advertising spend for this game to get the hype out there, and it achieved its goal. It sold a lot of copies on day one, but it's actually not that good. Uh, and people were very disappointed, and the developer is going through all kinds of problems. But that doesn't matter. They sold. Maybe they will not build the franchise because the game doesn't hold up, but at least they achieved their initial uh, goal, which was build the hype, sell a lot of copies on day one. The other side of the spectrum is mobile. This is a game called Lords Mobile. It's currently top 40 grossing in Germany. Uh, I just picked this because it was the first ad I could find on my phone yesterday. This is a typical mobile ad. You show a game screenshot, logo, download now, play for free. Copywriters are going out of business because we don't do creative headlines in mobile. We just do play now for free. Doesn't matter what game. Um, 
Of course, this was like an actual like 25 second interstitial, but this was on a mobile device inside another game. It, it's probably paid either on CPM or CPI. The guys that are doing this campaign are really angry that I did not install, that I only watched this to get to like replenish my army in the other game I was playing. Um, this is the kind of advertising we do for mobile games. We just want to know that what we're spending now is having a return on investment in three days, seven days, 10 days. That's all we care about. We just want our money back right away because we don't have that much money. We have to be careful with our money um, and we want to see that it's working for us. We don't want to spend two years spending money hoping that we will sell. We need to know right away that we perform. So that's a very big, two very different mindsets. However, the world is changing. And recently, weird things started happening in the mobile space. So this is uh, Angry Neeson 52. Uh, Liam Neeson reprising his role in the movie Taken for a TV ad uh, for Clash of Clans. And it's actually not just a TV ad, it was the Super Bowl ad in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. So quite a big deal. Buying a Super Bowl ad is really expensive. Getting Liam Neeson to do an ad is really expensive. And then making it really funny, because he's doing this taken line, like, I don't know who you are, but I will find you, and I will kill you, blah, blah, blah. So it's really fun. It's really good. This was very expensive. This was traditional media for a mobile game. Anybody know this lady? The guys in the audience might know her. This is Kate Upton. Uh, Kate Upton starring in an ad for Game of War Fire Age from Machine Zone. This is um, late 2014. It gets worse. This is Mariah Carey <laughs> starring in an ad for the same game even singing her song, Hero. And then, now it gets better again. This is Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, who is the testimonial for Mobile Strike, also by Machine Zone. His face is even on the app icon, uh, and he's getting a revenue share from, uh, from the game developer. So what the hell is going on here? This is traditional media. This is very expensive, getting these people on board to get uh, attention for your game. And why are the companies doing this? Well, because mobile, mobile advertising is becoming very, very hard to do these days. There is a lot of competition. Um, the visibility in the app stores is very, very bad. It's really hard to you know, uh, be seen with your title. And if you want attention, you have to go to extreme measures to get it. And these guys cannot afford it because they're like top five grossing games. Clash of Clans for a long time was the top game in the app store. Game of War is probably the best or maybe second best monetizing game in the App Store. Mobile Strike is just a reskin of Game of War. So that's one thing, companies investing a lot of money into branding advertising or into uh, just really expensive testimonials. This is a very different phenomenon. Happened last year in the summer at E3. Uh, E3 is the most important gaming conference in the world. It's where all the Big guys like Sony, Nintendo, uh, not Nintendo, always, uh, Electronic Arts, Activision, all these people like come out with their new titles, they show their new consoles, they show the new games, all the important stuff. All the important publishers get their own press conference. And um, one publisher called Bethesda, who is doing Doom, Fallout, other games, they announced this title, Fallout Shelter, at their press conference last year. Um, it's a relatively simple mobile game. It was just designed as a marketing gimmick for the PlayStation and Xbox game, Fallout for whatever. Um, just a marketing gimmick. This game went to the top one download charts overnight, right after the press conference. And it also went into the top grossing charts shortly after for a marketing gimmick game that didn't even have proper in-app monetization. Um, and they spent zero money on marketing this. It just went to top one right away. And what, why am I saying this? Because it shows the power of the brand uh, fallout and the power of traditional communication in the form of a press conference of a traditional publisher. And now I have, you can probably guess my next example. This was pretty obvious. 
Uh, so Pokemon Go came out this summer in July. Um, it's essentially a pretty simple take on augmented reality apps which have been around for years. Walking around with your phone, looking at a map, it's not a new thing. This has been done like when the iPhone came out. But now it has Pokemon. And because it has Pokemon, it's the top game all over the world. It made $500 million in 90 days. Um, they didn't spend a lot of money on marketing. People were playing this game here in Berlin even before it was available in Europe, like officially. People were just downloading it somewhere. Why? Because Pokemon is so strong. My generation grew up with Pokemon. In the 90s, we, if you had some Nintendo device, you were playing Pokemon. Pokemon saved Nintendo's ass countless times over the last 20 years. There is an anime, there is movies, there's millions of DS games. Um, it's a super strong brand. So brands are important in mobile too. And of course they are. Um, and I'm giving these examples to really under, under, underline the point that marketing for mobile games is growing up. We're not just talking about, ah, oh, let's spend 50K and make 100K because we are so smart at targeting and we really know the ROI of our user and we are only targeting males 22 to 24 that are interested in whatever. That doesn't work anymore. It's too expensive. CPI is so high, it, it doesn't work. And then also, what I mentioned earlier, mobile games are there for the long run. It's a game as a service. Our game, which I'll be talking about in a second, is now over two years old. Um, I don't know if we will acquire a lot of new people into this game, but it's still going strong, and we have to keep it going strong. And we want to keep this going strong, not like for one or two years. In 25 years, we want to still be there and be strong, like Pokemon now. And you can only do this if you invest in branding. You have to build your brand. Um, another example that I want to mention, because we talked about it yesterday at the speaker's dinner, is Hearthstone. Hearthstone is a mobile trading card game that's actually also on PC, but it's a trading card game based on the universe of Blizzard, which is largely the Warcraft universe, um, which, similar to Pokemon, has been around for 20 years. There's numerous Warcraft games. World of Warcraft was the you know, game-changing MMO in the West that a lot of people played. Um, Hearthstone is a top 20 grossing title all across the world because of the power of this brand. So we need to achieve the same thing. And if you're in mobile gaming today, you have to think long term. You can't just make the big success and after six months cash out. It's just not going to happen because the top spots are taken. If you look at the top spots and the uh, App Store rankings, it's the same games for a very long time. So with that in mind, we are also adapting our marketing approach. Or we already started investing heavily into TV in 2015. We started branding Summoner's War. We're still experimenting. Maybe we don't know as much about branding as we should, but we're making an effort. And um, so this is our title. It's called Summoner's War, launched late 2013. It's a top five grossing game in Germany, France, US, numerous other countries, Korea, Japan, China. Um, it's monetizing very well, but it also has a very core, like niche audience. It's very hard for us to acquire people into this game. Um, so we have to make it more known. Um, you probably don't know this title, even though it's top five grossing in Germany right now. Because who, who looks at the top grossing charts if you're not in mobile, in the, like in the industry? Nobody cares. But you know Clash of Clans. You know, maybe you know uh, uh, Game of War. You certainly know Candy Crush. You don't know Summoner's War. So we want to change that. So this year we did uh, a very, very big uh, campaign leveraging all kinds of media. We did a TV spot featuring Dave Franco and Alison Brie. We launched this spot in September, September 9, to coincide with a big game update. Uh, and we aired this in the US, in Germany, and in France. We also did out-of-home advertising, again, featuring Dave Franco and Alison Brie, and also featuring the Mons. This is how we call the monsters in Summoner's War. Uh, each of the two actors has like four guys in their team, and we are trying to give these Mons more character. So we um, feature them in our out-of-home ads, we feature them in certain vignettes that we use for uh, our online ads, and so forth. We also did influencer marketing. The guy on the right is called Amixem. 
He's a French YouTube personality. He regularly gets over one million views uh, on his videos. He endorsed Summoner's War for us uh, early October. These are the guys from Rocket Jump TV. It's an American uh, channel. They made a dedicated video for us doing Mon Daycare, um, where the monsters that are in our TV spot are hanging out in like a kindergarten type setting. And it's quite funny. Um, I don't have time to show all the videos. So I'm just going to limit myself to the character vignettes and the actual TV spot that we did, which is coming up next. This is the character vignette. Summoner's War. Download free on App Store and Google Play. So Summoner's War is about collecting mons, growing them, making them stronger. All these mons have like their individual character, and we want to showcase this character in this campaign. So we started teasing with these character vignettes. We did eight in total. We started teasing in July um, towards August for Gamescom in Cologne. We bought out-of-home advertising in Cologne and in Paris. Um, we seeded these teasers through online media, Facebook, YouTube, everywhere. And then in September, we culminated in our TV spot, which we are showing now, please. Hey, watch where you're going. Oh, I am. And it's right through you. Team up? Yeah. So this is just 25 seconds TV spot. We have a much longer version, which is almost uh, two minutes, which we're using online for various different uh, uh, showcases. Um, so that's kind of what we did. And I think what's going to be interesting for you is the question, does this work? How can we track this? Does this even make sense, or are we just blindly hoping for branding results. Um, as I said before, we've been doing TV since May 2015 in Germany and France. And since summer 2015, we are constantly in the top 10, uh, top grossing. So before, we were a top 20 game. And we were doing paid UA on all the channels that you can imagine all the time. But this game is very hard to convert. We pay really high cost per install. So the TV helped us make that next step into the top 10, which in itself is totally worth it. We also think that um, being on TV and becoming this viable brand um, makes it more easier for players to actually believe in this game. So a personal anecdote for me, when I played Pokemon for the first time, I immediately spent 10 bucks because I knew I'm going to keep playing this. Pokemon makes perfect sense. Hearthstone, I played it for half a day. I got an expansion pack for 30 bucks because I know Blizzard is great. So we feel like eventually this is the kind of reaction we want to produce, and we can produce this kind of reaction if we are cheap. So this is a result where we feel that it's been worth it. Um, obviously, I cannot share like detailed uh, results of the campaign, but these are the download charts just on Google Play for 2016 um, with the three big flights that we did this year in Germany. Um, so you can see in May, our TV spot wasn't that successful. So we had a long talk with DCMN. And we kind of changed our bias. <laughs> and then in June, we did much better. And then if you look at September, October, we did really, really well. So we went up to top 18 download charts in uh, Germany overall, which is pretty good for a mobile game. Um, so you can also see it kind of slightly starting to go up in August, because the middle of August is where Gamescom started happening. So we did this out of home campaign. Uh, we also did more online ads around that time. So it all kind of something happened. Um, I also want to share the top grossing charts, which are a little bit more consistent. This is just August, September, October. So in August, we were like, dipping dangerously low towards number 10. And we went up to a uh, top result of 
number two top grossing in both France and Germany on different days uh, in September and October. So for us, we're very happy um, with the path we have chosen so far. There's a lot of things that we would be doing different in the future, which is mainly due to influencer marketing, but that's a very hairy topic, and I don't really want to go into that now. It's for a different talk. Um, but yeah, overall, that's what we did. We're trying to build a brand, and we're, using, we're trying to use all available marketing channels. I think for mobile marketing, it's time to look beyond just CPI and to just do everything like you would do with every other industry. Um, that's kind of my talk. Thank you.